pediatric resuscitation. And um, I don't have any access to any brilliant technology or any new evidence that you're not aware of. Uh, my friends in the phone aid world have um, given me some papers. So um, by the time I finish this talk, this will be live on my blog uh, with all the references. So you don't need to write anything down. You can relax and go back to sleep if you want to. <laughs> So, you may or may not subscribe to this view, but I hope that in the next 20 minutes, half an hour, you'll feel more comfortable looking after kids. So, let's see where I've come from. I was born there in South Africa, called as with studying in Cape Town. Did my internship in the UK, plus a bit of extra A&E there. Uh, went back to South Africa, went to Melbourne to do emergency medicine and a bit of inpatient kids, went to Perth for two years to do a bit more emergency medicine, went to the UK to do some more kids, some more emergency medicine, and back in Perth for the last 10 years. And if my geography is right, we're about there now in Singapore. So I've come a long way, very happy to be here. And this is my happy hunting ground, this is where I mostly work at a mixed adult and Kids ED. We see about 92,000 patients a year, so not nearly as many as what you guys are used to, but quite big numbers for Australia. Um, that's the Kids Hospital. We see about 72,000 kids a year. Um, this is my other job. Um, so you can see that I have a vested interest in the acute care of um, children, and that's my boss in the back row. <laughs> So let's just jump right in. Uh, traditionally, we thought of asystole as being a hopeless kind of situation, and, and that is true in the medical setting. That still remains true, that if you have been in asystole for 20 minutes or more, then the outcome is dismal. So the chance of complete neurologic recovery after that is basically zero. Um, however, these guys recently in Spain published some data from their pre-hospital experience and they um, reported a 2.7% complete neurologic recovery in traumatic asystole uh, where there was chronic arrest. So that's a little bit surprising to me and it means that probably we should initiate life support efforts um, even in traumatic cardiac arrest. Thanks to Cliff Reed for that little nugget of information. So let's look at the things that we fool ourselves with, the things that stop us emotionally from taking care of kids as well as we take care of adults. Uh, I want to say that um, um, let's just have a look at these, these misperceptions. I won't know what to do. The stakes are too high. The procedures are too difficult. I don't have enough experience. Or well, I'm not emotionally strong enough. Let's just knock each one of those off the perch. Keep calm and follow the algorithm. Now, we have an algorithm that looks like this in Australia. It's nice and simple. Um, you may say, well, that's fine. If your child's arrested, then you know you go through the shockable or non-shockable pathway. Uh, if they're not arrested, you look for reversible causes, H's and T's. So not too complicated. This is what your um, PEA algorithm or non-shockable rhythm looks like. Stakes are too high. When um, Phil Dunphy was practicing for this um, tightrope feat, which is 10 foot above the air, um, it seems like a fairly impressive uh, feat. But he started one foot off the ground using the same equipment, same protective gear, and this is simulation. This is what you guys were doing on Friday. This is what Sim Wars is about. It's about having a go in a safe environment. And the actions, the, the actual balancing, everything that you do is exactly the same whether you're one foot off the ground or <coughs> at the top of a skyscraper. It doesn't feel like that. You know, it feels more stressful, but in fact, you do the same things. So even my four and a half year old boy, uh, that balancing, you know, he's doing the same motions as what he would be doing if he was on top of a skyscraper. <laughs> Not suggesting that I'm going to put him on top of a skyscraper. <laughs> The procedures are too difficult. Okay, things are smaller, but I think we have the fine motor skills to deal with that. 
and we have tools, we have toys, we have the um, intraosseous drill. If they're not that sick, maybe you don't want to drill them. There's this fancy piece of kit that projects a laser image of hemoglobin onto the skin, so you can see exactly where the veins are. Um, cheaper version, using a small LED headlight, you can transilluminate the hand of a small um, uh, toddler or neonate quite easily for about 10 bucks. When it comes to looking after airways, we've got a range of laryngoscope um, blade sizes and shapes. Traditionally, in infants, you'd use a straight blade and you would cover the epiglottis, um, whereas you know, an older child might use a curved blade in the molecular. But it doesn't matter what kind of blade you use and how you use it. Uh, you can use a straight blade um, to, uh, in the molecular, you can use a curved blade covering the epiglottis. It doesn't matter how you get the tubing, as long as you get the tubing. And, um, the feeling of celebration is the same, whichever method you use. <laughs> and if you can't get the tubing, you've got a backup plan, you've got plan B. Okay, so there's a range of LMA um, to, uh, options to do that. I don't have enough experience. So you don't need to be wrinkly or grey or old um, in order to conduct the orchestra. If you think of your team as each playing their role, they're each playing a different instrument. You don't have to go and play all the instruments at the same time. You can conduct from a central position, being calm and relaxed, following the algorithm. Um, and when, once you realize that, in fact, no one really has a wealth of experience resuscitating children. Okay, pediatric intensivists, they see a lot of sick kids, but they're seeing them in a different kind of environment to what we see them in in emergency departments or in the pre-hospital environment. So in fact there isn't anyone with a huge wealth of experience. So at the time when you're there and the patient's there, you're the best person for the job. You might feel that when the pediatric arrest buzzer goes off, you'd rather just run in the opposite direction. I know I feel like that. Um, there's a lot of emotional um, stress that goes along with resuscitating children and you might feel just because someone's put the superhero cape on you you don't really feel like being the superhero today but the reality is no one else is going to do it you're the person who's in that position which makes you the best person for the job so toughen up princess someone's got to do it and it's going to be you So, when it comes to all these weird things that kids get, you know, we can get stressed out. But I just want to remind you there's a final common pathway, whether you're having a respiratory reason or cardiovascular reason, it all goes the same way down towards the brain. So, uh, it doesn't really matter what the cause of their deterioration is. You're going to treat them in the same structured, supportive way. Uh, if you're obsessional like me, you might um, want to come up with a surgical sieve for all the conditions that could put you into um, a resuscitation kind of situation. But it actually doesn't matter because all you're interested in is the effect of each of those things on airway, breathing, circulation, disability. So don't sweat it if you don't have a diagnosis. It doesn't matter. <coughs> Which brings me to the alphabet. Uh, a lot of us in the room have built a whole career on the first five letters of the alphabet. Um, sometimes we don't even get beyond C, and there's a reason that it works, because it's simple and it stops you from panicking when you don't know what to do. So, we want an airway that's heaven protected, we want good oxygenation and ventilation, we want blood diffusing with a normal rhythm, good volume, good vascular tone, and we want to protect the brain by providing oxygen and providing perfusion. Don't ever forget glucose. So, it has been said that kids are not just little adults, but pediatricians are. So there are some things, there are some things that are a little bit different about kids, um, and I would contend that none of them are absolutely critical to saving their life. So it's good to know about some differences. They are smaller, so you'll have weight-based dosing. 
um, they're developmentally different, anatomically, physiologically. But then so are adults, you know, looking after a 20 year old with pneumonia is not the same as looking after a 90 year old with pneumonia. So things change with age, we know that about humans, they're still the same species. So there's some things like, you know, if they're in shock, the low blood pressure will be a late sign. So don't be waiting for that. They have soft chest which affects the way that we see uh, their work of breathing, which is different from ours. And they're prone to different injuries because their organs are relatively bigger, more exposed. <coughs> they also need more air, so predominantly it's more common for a respiratory cause to be the reason for their collapse and deterioration. And this is reflected in the Hillpool guidelines, um, uh, which have persisted over the iterations. Um, so we give for two hospital providers, we do a ratio of 15 to 2. Um, rather than 30 to 1 in adults or 30 to 1 in the pre-hospital environment. They need more air, but not too much oxygen. So there's been a bit of concern about hyperoxia. You know, oxygen is actually toxic. It causes free radicals. It can damage tissues. And um, so there's concern about, about um, giving too much oxygen. And in the delivery room for newborns, we have evidence that it's better to resuscitate them with room air rather than oxygen. Outcomes are better. They get cold feet more often, not just because they have a greater surface area to volume ratio, uh, so they get hypothermic, but also in septic shock, more commonly they'll have cold hands, cold feet, rather than warm shock with vasodilated peripheries. So don't be caught out by that one. Cold hands and cold feet, probably septic shock. Fluids can hurt them, fluids can hurt adults too, but maintenance fluids we know now, um, or we've known for a long time, that there's a really high risk of causing hyponatremia, brain swelling, death. And um, there's some prospective evidence from Australia, um, Adelaide and Sydney, um, which shows that using isotonic fluids, normal saline, uh, with glucose, for the younger kids to prevent hypoglycemia. That is a safer way to go, and hypotonic fluids are dangerous to kids. The like sugar, that little pictures to remind you, not ever forget glucose. We know that radiation hurts them more. I normally quote to parents of one in 500 to one in 2,000 risk of causing cancer with a scan. Where's my hand? The kid might get cancer <laughs> yesterday. Um, but you can add to that cognitive impairment. So we don't really talk about that. There's a study uh, in the BMJ uh, 2004 by Hall about some Swedish uh, data which suggests that if you have radiation to the head for whatever reason, you may not end up in a white collar job, you may end up in a blue collar job. Um, very surprising, but remember that the brain is developing and that radiation may not be good for the developing brain. So there's another reason to avoid unnecessary scans. And we have organizations um, which are constantly trying to produce new prediction rules to help us decide who to scan and who not to scan. We don't want to scan everybody. So there are some differences, but none of them are absolutely crucial. So I'd like to give you some things that you can take away, that you can use on your next shift, whether that's tomorrow or next week. First of all, you need to be prepared, and you can do this in a long-term, medium-term, and short-term way. So, long-term readiness, uh, there's a website, uh, a movement in the US called pediatricreadiness.org, and they estimate that about 30% of EDs in the United States are not ready to receive critically ill children. And the good thing is they have checklists of equipment that you should have, training that you should have, staff that you should have. So you can compare that against your own emergency department, even if you are working in a tertiary or children's ED. In the medium term, we spoke about simulation. Uh, I think we're realizing now that um, doing regular simulation training really improves the care. Um, of the resuscitation team. It gets the team to practice together. It really does work and it, and it improves um, care to our patients. 
So we use this kind of medium fire solution, which is for two iPads. Uh, we don't have the high fidelity dummies, but um, we have good control over the monitor screen, and that seems to be good enough to immerse people in the experience. In the short term, so this is when your patient is arriving in the next couple of minutes, or they've just arrived, you can think of some um, formulas. Uh, this is the mnemonic uh, wet fag. I don't mean any disrespect to cigarettes at all. Uh, if you want to, you could call it wet flag um, to remind you to work up the weight, energy, tube size, fluid, adrenaline, glucose. And that's roughly the order that you might need to use things. So you can write that up on your whiteboard. We use a whiteboard like that so everyone can see what doses you've calculated, everyone can double check. You could also use a spreadsheet to automatically calculate these things. Um, we have a, a web-based version. But the only proviso is that should be on a big screen so everyone can see it. Um, you could use a smartphone app. The disadvantage being you're the only one who can see it. So it does help for team communication to have that stuff visible. Fleming um, gave us a little gift in 2011, uh, and that is evidence-based vital signs, respiratory rate and heart rate. So we've been using for years and years the APLS or PALS cutoffs, which were mostly made up. Um, but if you look at the evidence-based um, norms based on about 70 studies, there, a lot of those values cut through the 50th centile and there were a lot of normal kids that would be considered to be in the abnormal range if you use those older cutoffs. So you can use that and the way that we've done it at our mixed ED is to go to page 13 of the supplement to the paper. So you have to go to the web supplement, go to page 13 and find a table of normal values and we just take it. 10th centile, the 19th centile, and the median. So people have a feel for what the normal range should be for that child, for the respiratory rate, or for the heart rate. The BLS algorithm, um, commonly when we're teaching this, or you know, when we're practicing this, uh, as people go, dangers, response, and then they go straight to airway, and I go, to remind them to send for help because everyone forgets to send for help and they forget it in sins, they forget it in real life. And I want to remind you that you're not alone, you have a whole hospital usually of people that want to help you. So call them. I've got a critically unwell kid, they will come, they will not say too busy. So remember that there's an S there, doctors ABC. It's not just one doctor, lots of doctors. So send for help. Let's go back to the alphabet, because we like the alphabet. <coughs> Cuff tubes are really okay. Um, I'm not even going to talk about it, because it's been discussed. Everyone's happy with it, apart from the neonatologist. But um, it's quite safe to use a cuff tube, and there is now some RCT evidence that the need to change the tube is less, and it does not cause post activation strider. Cryopoid pressure. I would suggest is completely optional, and given the option, I would suggest that you opt to not use it. Um, there is uh, a bronchoscopic study where they put bronchoscopes in, and um, even small amounts of cryopoid force distort the airway, compress the airway. Um, there's some older evidence dating back 17 years that cryopoid pressure may actually lower the esophageal sphincter tone. So it might actually cause regurgitation. You might not have known that. Uh, for me that's one of the compelling reasons to abandon it. Um, but if you need more, there's a study of 1,001 children uh, which showed that uh, with controlled RSI, without primary pressure, even with gentle bag mounts, ventilation during the apneic period, one child with gastric regurg no pulmonary aspiration. So maybe that's why they needed a thousand and one. They had to find that one child out of a No D sacs. Um, who's heard of this concept of apneic oxygenation in adults? A few. 
who's read Scott Weingart and Rich Levitan's paper from Annals of Emergency Medicine 2011? Great, great. You should get that paper because it's excellent. It's what medical literature should be. Gives you some background, shows you how to do something that really works that is different. Um, that will change your practice and I, I think that it will change your practice if you read that paper. What we're talking about is using nasal prongs, high flow oxygen, during that period of laryngoscopy. So you do normal pre-oxygenation um, and then you crank up the oxygen on the nasal prongs after you've paralyzed them so that you've got a constant flow, diffusion of oxygen from the pharynx down into the lungs. Because as oxygen is being absorbed, oxygen is flowing down at concentration creating. So it means you can prolong safe apnea period um, during that laryngoscopy period. So it works for adults. It probably works for kids. We don't have prospective evidence yet, but I reckon it's coming. So start practicing it because I think it's good. When it comes to breathing, just be gentle. Don't overinflate the stomach, particularly in the, you know, before you intubate someone. Once you've got the tube in, don't overinflate the lungs. Don't hurt them. Um, one practical way, if you've got a, a normal adult-sized bag, you can just pinch on the side of that. Rather than grabbing the middle of the bag and moving huge volumes, just pinch on the side. And don't overventilate them. You'll be quite stressed and quite pleased when you've got the tube in and everyone's kind of a bit anxious and you're, just, like, you're breathing at about 100 miles an hour. So just as a team leader, you can say, hey, just slow down a bit and breathe. Just calm down. So just be gentle with that. With shock, we always remember hypovolemic causes. We remember distributive causes like septic shock. But we may forget about cardiogenic causes in kids. So they can get biomyocarditis. They can get obstructive causes, much less commonly. So I use the chod mnemonic to remind me of those things. Keep pink, warm and sweet to protect the brain. Uh, again, maybe not too pink, not too much oxygen, not too warm. We don't know about therapeutic hypothermia, but I think uh, Gene's going to tell us about that later. And maybe not too sweet because high sugar accelerates the damage to the ischemic brain. So um, just keep them in that Goldilocks zone, just pink enough, warm enough, sweet enough. Um, by completely exposing your patient, you will not miss inflicted injury, um, non accidental injury, child abuse, uh, and you won't miss a subtle rash or subtle occult injury that you weren't aware of. And don't ever forget, in fact, you should forget glucose. Just forget it once because you will never forget it again. You'll feel like such a fool that it won't happen to you twice. So, what about crashing neonates? This is a, a situation that we all get a bit stressed out with. Newborn, first few weeks, pale, floppy, kind of, you know, you can feel your heart already going a bit faster. So what are the top causes of the crashing neonate? What are the top three causes of the sepsis? Sepsis, sepsis. But there are some other causes. So there might be a metabolic cause, or there might be a cardiac cause, which kind of makes you a little bit more worried but you don't need to worry. Let's just deal with sepsis. You can follow the surviving sepsis guidelines if you like. Um, they are reasonable, even though they've ignored the FEAST trial data from Africa from the Catherine Menken study, 2011. 636 references in the surviving sepsis um, document. No mention of Maitland at all. 2013 it was published, 2011 Maitland study. So, they neatly kind of just pretended a randomized control trial of 3,000 kids, just ignore that. The only randomized control trial of fluid management uh, of bolus fluids. Anyway, sepsis, easy. Fluids, antibiotics, early antibiotics. If you remember to, let, to check a lactate, then that's good. What about metabolic stuff, inborn areas of metabolism? Well, you might suspect that if you do a gas, an ISTAT, as you call it, um, and you see a profound acidosis with low blood sugar. Think about maybe there's something in the biochemical machinery that's not working properly. So do a gas and call someone who knows about this stuff. Now, cardiac stuff um, can be a bit tricky. Uh, if you're suspecting this, uh, the one situation I want to sort of talk about, because no one really explained this to me, um, 
So I want to explain it to you. And this is the duct-dependent lesion. So let's just look at the normal heart. You have two sides. You have one side that pumps blue blood to the lungs, and you have one side that pumps pink blood to the body. And hopefully it finds its way back to the other side as well. In kids, they have a, a ductus arteriosus, and the reason for that is they have pink blood coming from the placenta into the right ventricle, goes across the head and foramen ovale, and out through both tubes to the body. The lungs are closed off, high resistance, so you don't get any blood flow to the lungs in utero. And then when you're born, the lungs open up and blood goes, gets oxygenated in the lungs, and eventually the duct closes. And that's all good and wonderful. But what happens if you've got a big blockage on the left, like a pre-ductal cartation or hypoplastic left heart? So now, when you're born, all of your systemic blood flow to the body is going through that little tube. And that's fine until one to two weeks of age when that little tube closes and suddenly you've got low output kinetic failure, you've got a pale, floppy kid who's not diffusing. It can happen the other way as well. But what our job is to keep that duct open with prostaglandin E1. So while you're contemplating this, get someone to find the prostaglandin E1, the prostin, um, get ready to intubate because they can become apneic when you start the infusion. It can happen the other way in that um, you can have a duct-dependent pulmonary circulation. This works the other way. So you've got blockage on the right, all your lung blood flow is going through the duct, duct closes, you go blue. Okay, not enough blood going to the lungs. So hopefully you will feel that I've given you some tips there. Um, be prepared, use your normal vital sign ranges, send for help, use your alphabet to your advantage. Um, cuff tubes are okay. Think about using apneic oxygenation. Think about not using cryopoid pressure. So if we revisit these myths, these misperceptions, hopefully you feel that you know what to do. You can follow the algorithm. The stakes are high, but if you practice with simulation, then you realize that what you're doing is actually the same as what you do with adults every day. Procedures are smaller but you have a backup plan for everything. And you may not have enough experience, but neither does anyone else. And you can do it. Doesn't matter what the diagnosis is, you can still look after them. Use your alphabet. There's some differences. None of them are absolutely critical. And there's some practical pearls to help you. So you absolutely can resuscitate kids just as well as you can resuscitate adults in the pre-hospital environment, in your emergency department, on your wards. Totally comfortable that you have the training to do it. But if you'd like to know some more, um, I might have mentioned that uh, these talks will be on my blog, and in fact should have been published about two minutes ago. Uh, automatically. So if you want to go through the talk again, and the 30 odd references are on there, you can have a look at that. Um, and I might see you in about an hour's time for conducting the orchestra, uh, leading your pediatric research team. Thanks very much.